Hi, time for a transformer video. Recently I had a customer contact me. They had a music and sound intercom, which every once in a while I'll agree to do something about. The problem that they had was the fuse in the transformer had they thought it had blown. And this is the music and sound transformer. This is a music and sound model TE. 1A, and I think this is from a MC302, MC602, that series of intercoms. So they sent it to me. Oh, and this is not available for music and sound anymore, and even a really good search online couldn't find anyone that has any left. This, this transformer is probably from, it's about 1994, so it's about 16 years old or so. Music and Sound doesn't have these anymore. When she sent it to me and I opened it up to check out the fuse, which is on the secondary side here, the fuse was indeed blown. But the other thing that I discovered is the primary side, this side, which is the 110 side of it that gets wired into the house electrical circuit, the 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 windings on the primary side are open. There's a break or something happened to the windings and the primary side's dead. So this transformer is unrepairable. The only option on something like this is to replace it. And if you can't just find one to buy somewhere, you have to do something more than that. And that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna replace this transformer with this transformer. This is one that I bought from our regular electronic component supplier. It is virtually the same rating. This transformer is rated at, it's a 24 volt center tap transformer. I believe it's rated at 40 VA or 40 watts because you know around here we prefer watts to VA. This transformer is also a 24 volt center trap transformer. It does have a little higher capacity. It's rated at 56 VA or 56 watts, but that's okay. You can have more watts because as I've explained in other videos, the watts are the amount of available power. It's your bowl of power that you have access to or the unit has access to. The music and sound master station, it's only, only gonna take out as many watts as it needs when it's running. It's not like the extra watts are gonna ram themselves into the master station and damage it. So just a little larger bowl with a little more watts in it. The reason I chose this transformer, because there are lots and lots and lots of transformers in the world that you could choose from, a couple different things. One, it was the dimensions. The flange here on the bottom, the spacing between the mounting holes is identical to this one. So that makes my job a little bit easier. Plus this transformer comes with wires already connected into the windings of the transformer instead of having some kind of lugs that you have to solder to and then cover up and all that kind of stuff. So this is a more practical choice to replace this one. And that was the reason I chose it. I will put this in the in this video's description down below. I'll put the part number for it. And that way, if you're facing a problem like this, you can order one yourself. So what do we need to do this job with? Well, of course, you need the usual complements of tools and things. We need some screws, washers, and nets to mount the transformer onto the plate. Uh, we need a fuse holder and a fuse, and we'll talk about that in a second. And we need some heat shrink tubing and other miscellaneous stuff I suppose. About the fuse. This transformer, the original music and sound transformer, it says warning fused secondary do not short. I don't know when it was that someone decided that putting fuses on the secondary side of a transformer was a good idea. Back in the old days of music and sound intercoms, back in the mid 80s through probably the mid 90s, when they were making models like the N350 and N440 and N80 and those sort of models, the transformer, different configuration, it was on a angular or metal bracket and it mounted in the back corner of the wall housing. And all of those types of transformers, they actually had a fuse holder, something like this, that was mounted on the mounting bracket of the transformer. And if for some reason something went wrong and the fuse popped, you could just twist off the cap, replace the fuse, put the cap back on, and you're good to go, as long as whatever the problem that caused the fuse to blow has been taken care of. So I'm not sure when the changeover was made to put fuses on the secondary side, and I'm not saying that that makes this transformer virtually unrepairable for most people. We can do it, but it's not something most people would do. And I'm not saying that they did it so you would have to call them up and buy another transformer. I'm not saying any of that at all. I'm just saying I don't understand why they made the change. This transformer, does not have a fused 
anything. It's just a low voltage chassis mount transformer for safety and for reliability and to comply with the ever all important different ratings for safety that the original transformer had. We're going to mount an uh, inline fuse holder on the bracket here so if this customer did have a problem sometime in the future they can replace the fuse and they don't have to go through this whole giant hassle again. So let's go ahead and clear the workspace and get started. So the first thing I want to do before I take the transformer off the mounting plate is I want to figure out where our fuse is going to go. This corner right here where this opening is, this is where the plug sticks through and then there's the mating half comes from the master station and plugs into that. So we can't use that because that's for the plug. We also have to take into account the amount of space that we have in here and we don't want it too close to the edge where it could brush up accidentally with the wall housing because that's metal and that's grounded and that would all be bad. So I think the way to do this would be to put it probably about right there because there's a fair amount of space in this area it's going to be away from everything as near as I can tell. So I'm going to put my finger right there and I'm going to take my red marking pen and I'm going to put a mark right there. And that's where our fuse holder is going to go. The next thing we have to do is we have to get the bad transformer off of here. The other thing that you have to know is we're going to have to reuse this plug and some of these wires because this is a Molex connector. I don't have one like this and there's no reason to make up one new. This fits what's on the other end of the, of the cable. So we're just going to leave it like it is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to clip these off. And since this transformer is toast, we're going to clip them off kind of long. If they're longer than they need to be, when we get done, that'll be okay. We can always trim them. But if you make them too short, then it's too late. The transformer is held onto the plate with two rivets. And the easiest way to do this is use a cordless drill with a fairly good sized bit because you want to drill off the head of the rivet. You don't want to drill the whole rivet out. Just the head is fine like this. And sometimes that's as simple as it can be. Now we have to get this off. Oh, look, it came right off. What do you know? And if you look carefully, you'll see that the bottom of the two transformers are very similar. And if we hold them up next to each other like this, you can't really see that very well. Trust me, the holes line up perfectly. So this one's toast, but we're going to have a purpose for a little bit of this because we try to reuse stuff as much as we can around here. So let's get off the rest of the head here. Yep. And we'll get these rivets out. And there we go. So that's step number one. Step number two is we're going to drill the hole for the for the fuse holder next because we want to get all the drilling out of the way and done first. We don't want to be drilling around the wires on our new transformer. The easiest way to do this is here's our red dot and we don't want the bit to wander around as we begin to drill the hole. So I'm going to use my spring loaded center punch here. If you don't have one of these, I highly recommend you get one. All it does is it makes a little dimple in the metal. So when you put your regular drill bit there, it won't wander around and you can drill a more accurate hole that way. That'll work. So see I put this like this. And there's that hole and now we need to make it big enough to get the fuse body through. This is where our handy dandy stepped drill bit comes into play. This will drill a really nice even round hole without raggedy edges. And you can also go one step at a time to make sure you don't drill it too large. So we'll go ahead and we have the unit bit in the drill and we'll just start it here. could possibly be the right size. Nope, probably one more.
just like that. How's that? See what that take like 30 seconds to do. So let me go ahead and clean up all the metal filings and then we'll go ahead and start putting this thing together. All right, so our fuse holder is in place and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the nut on it, holds it on. Now, some of you might be th thinking, well, you don't really need a fuse. And I would say, sure you do. If you don't put a fuse, you run the risk of, best case scenario, you burn up your new transformer. Worst case scenario, could go on fire. Of course, that's not ever very good. So that's like that, bolted onto the back. That's good for now. Now, the next thing we need to do is we need to put our transformer in place. Now, all the wires are on one side. So, and the way this sits in the wall, far as I know, is this is the back corner, sits against the back part of the wall housing, and there's more room, a little bit more room on this side than there is on this side, so I'm going to put the wires on that side, like that, towards the front. And I've got some screws and nuts and washers. These are 832, that's number 832 thread with a split washer and a nut. Get that started. Put the other one. See, it's nice when it lines up. That's just an added bonus. When you look for something like this to buy, a transformer, you, it'll usually give you all of the dimensions and so forth. But you never really know for certain until you got it in your hand whether or not it's going to work out. If it didn't, then what I would have done is I would have just maybe used one of the two holes and then marked it and drilled for the second hole. So it's not really that big of a deal. It's just this way. It's a little less I have to do. So there's our new transformer mounted on the mounting plate. When I get all done with this, then what I'll do is I'll make sure that the screws and nuts are really, really tight, and then I'll put a little thread lock on them to make sure that they don't come loose at any time in the future. Uh, it's also a good way to keep track of nobody's messed around with it. So once we've done that, the next thing we really want to do is I want to wire up the fuse first, because that's just the way I like to do it. Now, the black and white wires are the primary side, they're 110, and what we want to do is we want to put the fuse on the black, through the black wire, on the hot side. So you got black is hot, white is neutral. So the electricity flows in on the black and flows out on the white. And it's always best to put the fuse on the black line if you can, because that's the hot side, so if it blows, then the power coming in is shut off. So what we're going to do with this is, we have to make one solder connection here and we have to make another solder connection here. So on this side it's going to be this wire and on this side we have to add a wire. And then the other thing we're going to do with this when we get done is we're going to put a piece of heat shrink tubing over it like this to cover up the bare connections because that way you don't have any live connections inside a metal box where somebody could touch it or lean on it or ground it out and get a spark and then everybody freaks out. And we don't want, we want to keep the freaking out to a minimum if at all possible. Because, you know, when you get a spark, then there's the running and the screaming and all of that and we don't need all that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this like that, and I'm going to strip this end back a little bit, and then I was thinking about using this, because see we have to add a piece of black wire here. I was thinking about clipping this one off, but the leftover piece is actually a little bit longer than the piece on the old transformer, so we're not going to use that. So we'll go ahead and we'll strip this end back. And since we're going to do the heat shrink tubing thing, you have to put the wires through the heat shrink tubing first 
before you solder them otherwise it won't slide down over it. So put this one in here and the way you want to do this is is you want to put it through the hole in the tab like that and then you want to fold it around the tab. This is of course as I have said in many 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 videos this is easier to do if you're not making a video. So there's that one and then the second one goes here and again it's got to go through the heat shrink tubing first before we put it in place because otherwise it won't be able to slide down over the end of this. So we'll put this one through and we'll bend it around. The reason you bend it around is because you want that sort of mechanical connection along with it being soldered. So once we've done that, we'll go ahead and solder it. Now, if you don't solder and you have to do this, you can get some crimp on spade connectors and crimp them onto the ends of the wires and then slide them down over the tabs. That's another way to go. that and we'll let that cool for a second make sure that it looks good see when you solder upside down like I was doing sometimes the solder all wants to flow to the bottom and you don't want gaps in the soldering that's better all right so once that's cooled off for a couple seconds, now we can slide our heat shrink tubing down over everything. this like that and then when we're all done and we do all the heat shrink tubing at one time then we'll heat it up and it'll shrink around everything and cover up all the connections so that side's done and now we have to do the white wire we don't care about we will wire tie some of this together so it's not all just flopping around in there uh, now we have to deal with this side so what I told you was the original transformer this one this is a 24 volt center tap transformer. So what does that mean? Well, it's a special kind of transformer. If you look here, coming out of the secondary side, we have three wires instead of two. We have a red wire, a yellow wire, and another red wire. So if this were powered up, and we'll do this at the end, if we measure, if you measure from the, the yellow is the center tap because it's in the center of the two red ones, right? Center, okay. So if you measure from here, yellow, to this red, you get 12 volts. If you measure from the yellow to this red, you get 12 volts. But if you measure from red to red, you get 24 volts. Pretty tricky, huh? So this is a popular kind of transformer to use in a lot of consumer electronic and other types of devices because you can get different voltages out of having a single transformer instead of having to have many different transformers. So it's more economical to do. It's a fairly standard item, a 24 volt center tap transformer, not a big deal. Regular out, center out, regular out. This one is also a center tap, see? three three nubs where I cut them off. This one, yellow on the outside, yellow on the outside, yellow with a red stripe on the inside. So it's a little, little backwards, but that's okay because we know here and we know on here where it's gonna go. So we know the yellow is our center tap. 
and the yellow or yellow with the red stripe is center tap and yellow here is center tap. So what we want to do is we want to we have to join these together. We have to splice them together. Now a lot of times when people splice wires, how do they do it? Well, they'll cut this off like this and then they'll do pair this one up like this and put like a wire nut or something on it. That's okay, but we can do better than that here because we have we have the advanced technology required to do it more neatly than that. So what I'm going to do is we're going to splice it this way in line and then we'll put a piece of heat shrink tubing over it to cover it up and that will be better because it's less bunchy and you don't have all this these wire nuts in the way and everything. Now since we have a fair amount of room in the can where this fits, I'm going to leave these reasonably long because this only has to go over here to the corner to plug in. So we don't need all of this. So I'm going to cut this about in half like that and then we'll strip it back again and just like we did on the fuse holder you have to put your heat shrink tubing on first because that's going to slide down around it. And in fact, we're going to be extra tricky on this one because once we put heat shrink tubing on each of the individual wires, then I want to put one big piece of heat shrink tubing over the splices of all three wires together. So what we have to do is we have to put the big piece on now also. So that one's going to go like that. And then we got to put the first red one all the way through. And try not to drop stuff on the floor. And for those of you who are thinking about it and thinking ahead, no, it does not matter which red wire goes to which wire on the plug it doesn't make any difference. It's just one side. They're both equal, so it doesn't make any difference. So we'll do like that. So we have the big piece of heat shrink tubing over all three wires, and right now the little piece of heat shrink tubing over on just the yellow wire. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and this, and I'm going to line them up this way, and then wrap them around each other like this. Now when you do it this way, so you end up with a nice straight splice. And then, of course, what we're going to do, if we can find it, is we're going to solder. Where'd the solder go? The solder went missing. Solder does that. All right. It'll show up between now and the end of the video, no doubt, because that's what always seems to happen. So we'll get out a new piece. that and now we'll solder our joint. Heat up the wire just like that. Okay there's number one. Now we have to do the red ones so I'll go ahead and strip back. I like to do these one at a time. That one and we'll make these red ones about the same length as the yellow one that we cut. And we'll put our little piece of heat shrink tubing over it like that. See? Heat shrink tubing. And then we'll take this and we'll wrap this one together. that and then we'll solder this like that there's two of them now we've got one more our last red wire clip this off strip it back and then we'll do our third one here And we'll put our last piece of heat and shrink tubing on our last red wire. And 
and we'll solder that. If you're able to do the soldering, it's the preferred way to do something like this because once it's soldered, it's a like forever joint. It's never going to come apart. You're never going to get any corrosion in it. None of that kind of stuff. Get all the scraps out of here. Alright, so there's our three splices. And now we're going to slide our individual heat shrink tubing over the splices. And you want to cover it up and get it spaced out sort of evenly on both sides so it's fully covered. And once we've done that, we'll turn on our hot air. Works better if you turn the switch on. There we go. We'll give that just a second to heat up. And now, we'll do some tube shrinking. And the nice thing about heat shrink tubing is it counts as insulation. This particular type of heat shrink tubing is rated at 600 volts for insulation. And also, most heat shrink tubing has a little bit of some kind of like adhesive inside of it. So when you shrink it on, not only does it shrink down and grab the wire, but it activates a little bit of adhesive so it doesn't tend to want to come off. So we're gonna let those cool down for a second before we slide the big piece down. Because one of the things you have to think about is, this is hot now, the heat, the hot air is running at 740 degrees Celsius. Oh no, Fahrenheit. And if you slide this over this while these are still hot, it's going to want to start to shrink and then it might get stuck and then you got a problem. So now that we've done that, we'll put the big piece over it. This is sort of the uh, belt and suspenders kind of part of this, which I'm a big fan of. And if you have this kind of stuff on hand, it only takes a second and it costs like pennies to do it really well. Now, if you don't have heat shrink tubing, you could get by, if you do it really well and carefully, you could get by with using electrical tape. But the problem with electrical tape can be that over time, especially in an environment that gets warm and transformer environments do tend to get warm, the it can start to unwind on its own. So if you're going to do it with electrical tape, you got to make sure you get enough on there and do it really well. So even if it does come a little bit unwound, you're not ex having any exposed wires. So we did that. So let's go ahead and do the big one on the fuse holder here. Like that. And see that's never going to come off now because it's shrunk down here on the body of the fuse holder where the threads are so now it's all squoshed into the threads and that's good so that'll never come off and see there's no exposed wires now it's all held together really nicely the next thing we need to do is turn oh we can't turn that off to it cools down a little bit we should do something with the white wire because it's kind of flopping around here and one of the things I don't want to have happen is have somebody accidentally rip this out of the transformer uh, winding and then it's all ruined at that point. So, what I think what we'll do with this is maybe we'll take this and we'll put a wire tie through the hole here to hold it in place. Alright, so what we're going to do is do this so you can see. So I'm going to put a wire tie wire tie I'm going to put it through the hole in the frame of the transformer and I'm going to wrap it around both the black and the white wires. I think it'll be long enough. Hold it. In place.
like that. So now that holds the white wire in place and the floppy piece of the black wire and see it's then it comes down here and goes into the windings. So that way it's not you're not pulling on the windings. So that's good. Okay. And then this, the plug, has to go through the hole and in the Molex connector. This is one of those kind of things where it's like there's a locking tab kind of thing. Let's see. Make sure we get it oriented the right way. And then you just push it in and see it fits like that and it stays in there. And the little locking ears are down here on the top of the plate down there. So when you go to plug in the intercom like this, it doesn't push back through the hole. There's all of that. Now the last bit we're going to do is we have to put our fuse in. If you look on the manufacturer's sheet for the transformer, it tells you how many amps, watts, and, and or amps this can produce. And this produces, if I remember correctly, yeah, I think it's like 2.64 amps. So when you choose a fuse, you want to choose a fuse that's just a little bit higher than what the output of the transform or what the transformer will draw. So I chose a 3 amp fuse, which should be plenty, and we'll put it in the fuse holder. Oh, and the other thing that I did was there are many different kinds of fuses in the world. This particular fuse is what's called a slow blow fuse. Two most common types are fast acting and slow blow. Fast acting fuses, by the time there's something wrong or the wire accidentally touches the wrong point and there's a little tiny beginning of a spark and just as your brain registers that, oh no, there's a spark, it's blown. That's how fast, fast acting, very, very quick. Slow blow fuse, you got a little bit more leeway. This will take, you know, probably three, four, five seconds to blow, something like that, slow blow. And it gives you a little more leeway. It still protects everything the same way. There's no reason for it to have to blow so quickly. It's just there to protect the transformer. So we'll put that in there and we'll twist the cap. See, now when this is installed in the customer system, the transformer is protected because it has the fuse. And if something were to go wrong and overload the transformer for a few seconds and it blows the fuse, all they have to do is turn the cap, take it out, replace the fuse, and then put it back in. Now, things about fuses are, I chose a three amp fuse because that's the correct rating. I'm going to put a label on here that says use three amp fuse only. It's not fair, it's cheating and it's risky. You know, some people it's like, oh, three amp fuse blue and I got a problem with the intercom and you know, so I'm gonna go ahead and put a 10 amp fuse in there because that's not gonna blow. Well, you're probably right, it probably won't blow, but what it will do is burn up your transformer and or catch your house on fire. So don't do something like that because it's wrong. That's like old houses that had screw-in glass fuses. People wouldn't have a screw-in fuse. So what would they do? They would put a penny in the socket where the fuse goes and then screw the fuse back in and to bypass the fuse basically. And then the question always is, how many amps is a penny? I've never gotten an answer to that, so I don't really know. So there's our rebuilt transformer. Now what we need to do is we need to set it up and test it to make sure it works properly. So I've got it wired up to my bench power supply. So we'll go ahead and flip that on. Oh good, no smoke, no flames, no running, no screaming. Bench power supply is set at, I think 115 volts, which you can see on the meter, 117.7. Let's get it down to one 15-ish. Good nominal amount. We'll go with 114.9. That's close enough. Now, if you remember, our connections on here are red, center, and red. So center and red, 12 volts. Center and red, 12 volts. Red and red, 24 volts. So if we go ahead and measure, we'll do left, red, and center. 13 and a half, center and right red, 13 and a half, red and red, 27, 26.9. 26.9. And now right now you should be going, but, but, but you said, you said 12 and 12 and 24, so why is it more? Well, it's more because ratings on transformers are the output 
under a load. And right now we have no load. If you plugged the music and sound intercom into this and turn it on, there would be some load. If you played music and turn it up loud, there would be a greater load. And the idea is that the voltage coming out of the transformer should not drop below 12, 12, and 24. That's the whole idea. Right now it's a free running transformer. The other thing is the amount of line voltage in makes a difference on the voltage out of the transformer. So our line voltage in right now is 115. If we lowered that down, it would lower down these measurements some. So it's completely normal to have slightly more voltage on a free running transformer than you would on one that was hooked up to a device. So this works properly and that's pretty much it. So if you've got one of these intercoms, some type, music and sound or something else, where the manufacturer no longer has replacement parts, and this would be considered a primary part. This is like the most important thing because without this, it doesn't do anything. If you've got a bad transformer, odds are if you look around, you can find a source of a replacement transformer and build your own. I hope you found this interesting and perhaps for someone it will be helpful. If it is, give it a thumbs up on YouTube because that helps us just a little bit. There'll be a banner right here that shows you how to subscribe. Go to our YouTube homepage, click on the bell. And when you click on the bell, click on it to receive all notifications. And every time we post a new video, you'll get a notification and you can watch it. That's all for today. See you on the next video.